All right, so we had just picked up with the human creation perspective, the, the creation perspective on origins. We've already discussed briefly the evolutionary perspective. And the first big kind of take home point that I made based off of uh, the short time scale that the Bible made is that Adam was an adult and probably was never an infant or a child. And the, the reason that this is so important is because I think this can provide biblical support that something can appear older than it actually is. So I think Adam, when he was zero years old, he lived to be 930 years old, he probably was younger than he really appeared. So he appeared older than he actually was. Most likely Adam was an adult on his very first birthday. Or was created in this older state. So I think we realistically can make a step, and I don't think it's a huge step, I don't think it's a big thing of faith, but I think we can make a step to apply this concept to the earth. And when we apply it to the earth, that also means that the earth can be older than it appears. So the Earth actually can be older than it really appears. It can appear to be 4.6 billion years old, yet still only be relatively young, 6,000 years old. And there is, I believe, biblical support to make that claim. Now, you'll remember that life appears to require a replicative genetic material, and that needs to be inserted into a cell. Or into a, I'm sorry, into a lipid bilayer to create a cell. So I want to take a look at that as well and see if we can maybe rectify some of this. So evolution requires the formation of RNA, that replicative genetic material. And you'll remember that I said that this is actually confirmed in lab experiments. We actually can create the requirements. We can generate RNA that fits the bill for the replicative genetic material using an atmosphere and an environment that was very similar to what we expect based off the scientific observations at the very beginning of when life came around about three billion years ago. So we actually can do that. You'll remember that that experiment was called the Yuri Miller experiment. And this is purported to have that confirmatory power. And it is pretty convincing that that can happen under the right conditions. So what does the Bible say about creation and even creating a strand of RNA? The Bible says at the very beginning, in the beginning, God. God created all things. If God created all things, that includes things like army. It doesn't just include you and me and the animals, it creates every intricate detail of those organisms right down to the information that holds the key to understanding, the key to creating life. So God created all things. Evolution does require the formation of RNA. The biblical worldview also requires the creation of RNA. The Bible says that God, by his hand, has done this. There are experiments that confirm that it actually can be done by natural mechanisms. But just the creation of RNA is probably a significant overstatement.
what I mean by that is even though life requires the creation of this replicative genetic material, and it's shown through the Yuri and Miller experiment that this actually can be done, it's a significant overstatement that the created RNA was extensive enough to give rise to one single cell. Okay, so I want to take a look at this, and we're actually going to handle it mathematically, and I'm going to do my best to keep everybody on the same page as we go through this. But really, we needed RNA, but we didn't just need RNA. We needed RNA to be extremely complex. That code in the RNA, the complexity needed to be such that it coded not just proteins, but proteins that were functional to sustain life. I can put a bunch of monkeys in a room with, with computers and with typewriters or whatever, and they can go in there and start banging out a sequence of letters. Right? They've actually done this experiment before. And the work that was created was nothing like Shakespeare. It was nothing like biblical text. It was no sort of coherency in the text that was written. In fact, some of the monkeys who sat there pressed the desk for hours. <laughs> there's no there's no significant ability to create words that have meaning, words that tell a story. So even experimentally, when you put random chance a monkey to a keyboard, you don't get complexity that codes for anything with me. In the terms of the biological world, that complexity needs to code for proteins. So the statement that Yuri Miller shows that we can make RNA is fair, but what's not fair is the Yuri Miller experiment shows that we can make RNA that is complex enough. So the simple formation of a molecule in a given environment with the given constraints of that environment, the simple formation is not enough. It's not complex. It's just a bunch of S's all in a line that say nothing. I think at best the Yuri Miller experiment may show how God actually could have done this. It doesn't require three billion years, and it does not, uh, and it cannot just be a simple unguided process. It has to be guided in order to get the complexity that is required. So, simple formation of uh, a simple formation of an RNA molecule is totally irrelevant. The real question is, can we create a molecule of RNA that results in extreme complexity? And I'm going to show this to you mathematically why this is totally irrelevant. The other thing that's really interesting about the Yuri Miller experiment what did the Yuri Miller experiment also require? People to run the experiment, making the decision on what to put in, making the decision on when to make it function and how to make it function. In other words, there was an experimenter who was acting upon that mechanism to create the RNA. We call that agency over mechanism. Agency is the individual who oversees the experimental mechanism to make the experimental mechanism work. And I'm assuming Yuri Miller, I don't know the two men, I'm, I'm assuming they were extremely intelligent. So not only did the experiment create RNA, it created RNA in such a way that extreme intelligence was required <coughs> to create that RNA. Sounds a lot more like a biblical worldview now than an evolutionary worldview. Now I'm going to try to show you how this complexity is nearly impossible 
with the given time scale and those random processes of evolution. So I want to introduce you to an organism that I'm assuming probably none of you have ever heard of before. This is the smallest self-replicating genome. An organism contains the smallest self-replicating genome. So what exactly does that mean? Okay, so the smallest self-replicating genome. This is an organism, it's a single cell organism, that within its genome, it has 552 genes. And those 552 genes give rise to proteins that confer physiological function for that organism. Those 552 genes are held in a sequence that's 490,885 nucleotides there we go that's 490,885 nucleotides long think of those 490,885 nucleotides let's call it a half 500,000 as being individual 500,000, 500, half a million individual letters. And there are four of them, A, G, C, T. And within that language, they have to be organized in such a way that they can create words, 552 words that have meaning. Okay? So, Putting this analogous to the English language, we really have 27 possible letters, including the space, 26 letters plus the space, to create hundreds of thousands of letters in the English language. Okay? So we have to accomplish 500,000 letters in a sequence that have 552 genes that are functional that are complex that are usable for life. Alright? So this pro this uh, organism by the way, smallest known genome, self-replicating genome, is called nanoarchaeum of quantics. This is a archaea. Not a eukaryote, not a bacteria, it's a key. It's kind of this middle of the road type organism. Okay, so single cell, packed away in its genome, you have just about a half a million nucleotides. So in order to kind of follow the math here, we gotta understand a little bit about probability. What we're trying to do is we are trying to create the correct sequence. Of all 490,885 nucleotides. So let's start out with a really short example. Um, I can give you the letters T, O, S, and P. Okay, you got four different letters. How many words can you make? Well, that's not a word. Possible. It's not a word. But we can get things like pots, or things like stop, or things like tops. Or we could even just use three of the letters and we could get top. Okay? So I could do some math here and I basically can tell you how many different four letter sequences there are. And we could compare that to how many of those four letter sequences actually make a word. And we get an idea of the number of words that are correct sequences compared to the number of four letter sequences that are not words. Does that make sense? So some of those things are not going to be functional. T-O-S-P 
is not a word. T-S-O-P is not a word. P-O-S-T is a word. So you go through and you create all of these different words or sequences. Okay? It's going to require probability in order to do this. If we apply that same idea, we can actually look at this whole sequence, almost 500 million, and we can figure out how many possibilities there are. So the correct sequence, in order for this organism to survive, it must be formed. And in addition to just simply forming it, it must be inserted to a protein lipid binder. So we can't just simply form nucleotides. We have to form the nucleotides. We have to put them in the right sequence. We have to insert that right sequence into a protein lipid bilayer. We have to begin to utilize that information to create new cells that function to get this whole thing to move forward in the right direction. So our language here has just simply four letters, four nucleotides that you can choose from. Since we're dealing with RNA, it's A, G, C, and U. If we're dealing with DNA, it would be A, G, C, and T. Okay, so A, G, C, and U. Those are my four letters. Those are the analog analogous to the TO, TOSP. Those are the four letters I have to choose from. And I have to put together basically one big complex piece of information that's about a half a million nucleotides in length. And within that half a million nucleotides, I have to have 552 functional genes, genes that can be utilized in the body. Now, 500,000 really isn't all that big. 500,000 is probably on the order of about a 200 page paper, 200 book, or 200 page book. We have lots of 200 page books. But what would happen if I had a 200 page book and right in the middle of it, I misspelled the word? I've added in information that now no longer makes sense. In terms of reading the book, there's still a lot of information that makes sense in that book. If it's just two letters and I switch them around, let's say I do something like that. We call it imitation. If I do that in a book, in literature, you get to that part and you're like, oh, that's a typo. But everything else makes sense. But what happens in the biological world? You make one mutation and you actually can significantly change the entire organism. There are diseases that are from one nucleotide chain becoming some other letter instead of the letter that it's supposed to be. We have diseases that eliminate that organism's ability to reproduce. And it's because we're not just dealing with information, we're dealing with a network of information. It's all interconnected. So it's not just 500,000 nucleotides anymore. It's 500,000 nucleotides where the beginning of the story interacts with the end of the story, and interacts in the middle, and interacts everywhere in between. So we have this huge, complex network of information all interacting together. Everything is interconnected with this. This is extremely complex. We haven't even figured out how to replicate this complexity in the digital world using computers. We're not even close. So what's the probability of having an A, a G, a C, or a U at any position along that 500,000 nucleotide sequence? So let's say the very first sequence, the very first spot in that big long sequence, what would be the probability that I find an A What's the probability I find a G? What's the probability I find a C or a U? <coughs> I'll give you a little hint on this one. One out of four. 25% chance that I'm going to find any of those four. I have four different options. Each of them are just as likely. I find an A 25% of the time. 
C25, G25, and a U25% of the time. Okay, so I have a one in four probability at each position. Now, using that, I can say, okay, I've got a 25% chance that at the first position I'll have any of those four. Now we can take it a step up. Let's look at two positions. What is the probability that I will find a A? It's one out of 16. And Brittany, can you give us a little bit of help on how you figure that out? Normally what you do is you take the number of possibilities and you raise it to the power of two or the number of spots that you have to calculate the total number of possible two-letter sequences in this case. A, 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 G, A, C, A, U. Okay, so there are going to be four to the power of two, four times four is 16. Any given one of those is one chance out of the 60. Okay? So using the same concept, four raised to the two, four is the number of nucleotides we have, the two is the number of positions. You see where this is going, hopefully. What, how many possible sequences do I have if I have 500,000 positions? Four to the 500,000. Okay? So, one in four probability each individual position. We use the principles of probability, the laws of probability. And we can calculate the number of possible sequences for all 490,885 positions. Hopefully someone has already done the calculation in their head. Just kidding. So I'm going to try to make this a little bit more simple. We're going to just use 500,000, not that far away from our 490,885. Okay, so 4 to the 500,000. How many of you think we're at something like a million possibilities? A billion possibilities? A trillion possibilities? Are we getting close at a trillion possibilities? We're not even close. Going back to shaking his head. This number right here is 2 followed by 60,202 zeros. Two, zero, 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 zero. I mean, there's not even a name for this number. 60,202 zeros. Now, that's a lot of zeros. Your calculator is not going to be able to do this. To do the calculation on the computer, it actually takes the computer concepts to do the calculation. Okay, so let's deal with that number. That's the total number of possible sequences for this organism, nanoarchaea macquasis. Okay? Now, what you need to know about the human genome is you are all separated by less than 1%. So, of all of the possible sequences that you have, it's less than 1% that are going to be sequences that give life. I'm going to really, really give some favor here to the evolutionists. I'm going to let him have a really, really big advantage. I'm going to say that half, not 1%, half all of the possible sequences from this anarchium could give rise to could give rise to a functioning organism. Okay, so if I say half of the possible 
sequences to give life. Now where are we? I basically am taking this number here, our 2 followed by our 60,202 zeros, dividing by 2, and I'm saying all of those are possible. That number reduces by a staggering amount to 1 followed by 60,202 zeros. So it's still a massive, a massive number of possibilities here. Okay? So basically where I'm going is I'm going to ask, how quickly can we manufacture one of those sequences? And it's going to take, by rules of probability, this amount of time to do that. But it's only going to take that amount, amount of time to do it if there's just one place in the infinite universe that is attempting to create this molecule of RNA. Yeah, I'm going to bring it home now and, and, and really kind of circle the wagon so you can see the magnitude of what is trying to be accomplished. Okay, I'm going to make some assumptions, and these assumptions are totally ludicrous. And when I say totally ludicrous, I mean this is not the way that it works in reality. The universe is not near this functional, not near this efficient. So we're going to assume that the entire universe, the entire universe, has this ability to assemble one 490,885 nucleotide long molecule per second. Okay, so every second, these random processes everywhere around the universe can create one of these nucleotide sequences. I have to literally create 1,000 followed by, or 1 followed by 60,202 zeros. I have to create that many of them before I'm going to actually create them. Okay? So we got our universe clicking away, creating one of these. So how long is it going to take? If the whole universe is produced one. How long is it going to take? What type of time scale would be required until we get our first successful life-giving molecule. Okay, so we're going to use the number of seconds, or we're going to calculate the number of seconds to create a life-giving molecule. Well, the number of seconds is actually going to be that one followed by our 60,202 zeros. All right, so let's talk a little bit about time. Anyone know how many seconds there are in a year? You can calculate it pretty quickly. I'll give you a little help there. There are 3.2 times 10 to the 16 seconds in a billion years. So a billion years is 3.2 times 10 to the 16 seconds. You can already see where this is going, because this number up here is 1 times 10 to the 60,202. In a billion years, we're only up 16, not 60,202. We're way, way off. 
So if we apply that and we're assuming that the universe is super efficient and can generate one molecule per second, then within the first billion years, remember, life has been around for how long? Three billion years. So if life has been around for 3 billion years, and the entire universe has been around for 20 billion years, we have 17 billion years to get up to 1 times 10 to the 16,202. That's 17 billion years to create the first molecule of the smallest organism that will become our ancestral lineage to become, uh, to produce all of the diversity that we have. Okay, so we should expect 3.2 times 10 to the 16 sequences every billion years, 17 billion years to do that. After the first 17 billion years, we would have experienced a tiny fraction of all possible nucleotide sequences. And this, by the way, is just to create the tiniest living cell. 3.2 times 10 to the 16 the first year, 3.2 times 10 to the 16 the second year, 3.2 times 10 to the 16 year, 3 through 17. And we're only at a tiny, tiny fraction of our 1 times 10 to the 60,000. Not even remotely close to a point where we would have generated our very first nucleotide sequence. That then has to be slipped into a protein lipid bilayer. That then has to be given all the nutrients and everything that would be required for its survival. To then begin to add new information as new organisms are created towards our way, towards diversity. I hope I have you convinced that even this process here would require some sort of interaction with an agency. So we would need experimental agency no matter the way we look at it. If we look at it from an evolutionary worldview, the probabilities are too high. Something has to be guided. If we look at it from a Christian worldview, the time scale is too small. Something has to be guiding the process. So we need experimental agency no matter where we go. And that experimental agency is actually given every time we do a confirmatory experiment. And I've already mentioned Yuri and Miller. They were the experimental agents over the Yuri Miller experiment. They guided the process. They had intellect. They had knowledge of what it should look like in the end. They knew how to get there. They had to oversee the entire process. And they were not able to stay separate from the process. So the experiments to produce the nucleotides in the lab to begin with, to begin with, required an experimenter to operate the lab, operate the equipment, operate everything. And so at a minimum, what the Yuri Miller experiment actually shows is that you can create the required molecules as long as you have agency acting upon that mechanism. <laughs> and so if the probabilities are so high, and we need an agency to operate the experiment, then I think it's very, very reasonable 
to suggest that no matter which worldview you choose, you are going to require agency to begin life. If you come at it from an evolutionary worldview, agency is required to undo the probabilities. If you come from a, from a biblical worldview, the story is written right at the very beginning, in the beginning, God. So no matter the way you look at it, you need that agency to be in place. So I believe that it's very reasonable to suggest that an agent is required. And I believe that it's a step even more in uh, a reasonable direction to suggest that that agent is recorded in the Bible. And the experiment is laid out. Now we may be able to look at this evolutionary data, things like the Ira Miller experiment and a host of other really great data sets, and get an idea how God might have created these things. When I surveyed Genesis chapters 1 and 2, and I surveyed the Psalms, and I surveyed the Bible collectively as a whole, when it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, I think it very reasonably could be an explosive, energy-filled experience. And literally, God pulled from nothing everything. And as he pulled nothing from everything and was the essence of energy himself, pulling out all of the things that now exist, that it may give us the appearance that things exploded onto the scene. And that just depending upon the worldview, the lenses that we view this whole process from, if we have God out of the equation, it was just simply a big bang for whatever reason. But if we put God in the equation looking at that exact same data, we see a plan. We see a perfect plan. Now, I started this whole lecture and I alluded to the fact that God is the creator of everything that's around us. But I didn't tell you why I think God created everything around us. And the reason that is is because we are special and we are created for his pleasure and for his glory and for his worship. And so where I believe the evolutionist really gets it wrong are the, it is related to the question, are humans special? You will remember that even contemporaneous in the evolutionary worldview, contemporaneous with modern humans, homo sapiens, you and I, we've had things like the Neanderthal, and things like Homo floresiensis, also called the Hobbit. That means that Homo sapien was nothing special. And then this world may actually be very much meaningless. But quite to the contrary, I believe that there is beauty and meaning all around you. And even as I go through chapter 1 of Genesis, God creates a bunch of stuff. On day 6, he creates humans and he creates animals. Days 1 through 5, he creates everything else. The ship and sea, the plants, the sun and the moon, the seasons, the stars in the sky, the atmosphere, the earth itself, creates everything else. And every day at the end of the day, with the exception of one, God says, and it was good. Days one through five, it all ends, and it was good. God saw it, and it was good. What does it say at the end of chapter, or at the end of day six? Does anyone know? It says nothing, actually. So God creates human, God creates animals on day number six. And he just finishes up the day. And then on day seven, he rests. And on day seven, when everything is complete, that means he rests, surveys the works of his hands. And man is placed at the very pinnacle. Adam has been created, 
and he has been created to worship and obey, to till and to work the land. Now everything is very good. So it's not until humans are put in that humans take that special role as being the image bearers of Christ, being the image bearers of God, that creation becomes very good. And then as you go through the rest of Genesis, you basically see the first section of Genesis being the creation and the story of God with man. And right in the center of the garden, there's a tree. And it's not the tree you're thinking about. The tree you're probably all thinking about is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that tree of knowledge of good and evil was the tree that Adam and Eve were never supposed to eat from. But we know that they did. We know Eve was tempted by the serpent, and man sat around lackadaisically as his wife consumed the tree. And sin entered the world. No, the tree I'm actually talking about is the tree of life. And it was right in the center of the garden. And I don't think it was symbolic. I think it was a real tree. And what you'll see in the scripture is these special humans are basically guarded against from reaching out and, and taking from the fruit of the tree of life. In scripture, it says that he places two cherubim outside of the gates of Eden to the east. And then there's this thing described as being a flaming sword that moves every which way. We have the sentry guard of the cascade protecting the entrance into Eden. And the reason that that's placed in there is because God says, and this is something that confused me for years, but God, it says, does this to basically protect the path or to prevent humans from walking the path to the tree of life so that they could reach out and they could not grab from that tree as to have it. And it confused me for such a while because I said that that's the whole point. Christ came into the world 4,000 years later so that we could have eternity. Why, why would the Lord just not allow humans to reach out and grab from that, from that tree to have eternity? Well, the real answer is, had they done so, they've already eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and sin has entered the world. And you all know that Christ is required because God cannot be with those who have sinned. And Christ makes the path through the cross to separate us from our sin. Had Adam and Eve been allowed to grab from the tree of life, they would have had eternity. But they would have been separated eternally from God because of the sin that was committed when they took from the fruit in the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God protected us. God protected the whole of humanity because humans are entirely special. And we are the image bear bearers of Christ. And if you read through the rest of the Bible, the Old Testament is entirely about Jesus. The Psalms reflect Christ. And then we get into the New Testament, and we get the New Covenant through his blood and through the body that was broken on the cross to rectify what was done in the garden. And so Romans 6.23 is real. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Because you are special, humans are entirely and completely special. The world in which we live in is magnificent, and it's meaningful. In Psalm 139 is ever true, that you are beautifully and wonderfully made. You are stitched together by the hand of God. And I hope that we've been able to reflect just some of that this semester as we survey human biology and we look at all of the magnificent things in this rusty old shell. And I do look forward to a new body someday, a glorified body that fixes all of the rest. And even still, I pray that it stops working. So really, the end here. Are humans special? I'm not going to leave you hanging. I believe that the answer to that, as I will live into the Bible in the case, the humans were special and true. You are specially created by God. And you are here not to spread the gospel. That's one thing that you should do in obedience. 
Not to be baptized, that's one thing you should do in obedience. Not to love Christ, that's one thing you should do in obedience. But to stay fixed on God. Because you are here for his pleasure. You're here to worship and to obey him. To resemble him in everything you do, whether it's your education or your marriage. You're to be his image, first and foremost. And hopefully everything else is a outpouring of that desire to bear the image, the very image of your That's all I have.